Hello everyone, my name is Bedram and I'm a professor in data analytics. Welcome to another episode of Deep Learning. All right, module two, let's set up our deep learning environment. So as you can see, there are a bunch of different packages, libraries, and platforms that we can use for the deep learning course. And so here is the one setup that I'm gonna use for the course. So I just wanna make sure that you're all on the same page. Okay, so this is our second module. In the first one, we talked about introduction to deep learning. We compared it with machine learning and statistical learning. And we said that the deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of AI. So we, th we saw that how the neural networks work, why basically neural networks work, and why now, why today, okay? So in this module, let's talk about um, how to set up your Python environment. All right, first things first, let's start by installing Python, and I'm gonna install it through the Anaconda, okay? So uh, in, in this module in general, I'm not gonna show you the steps of installing packages and different platforms. I assume that you're savvy enough, you can figure it out. So I'll show you what are these packages, what are these, uh, for example, platforms, and where you can find the documentation, and you do the rest. Okay, Anaconda is a distribution of Python and R languages for scientific computing. A cool thing about Anaconda is that basically it helps you to manage the package environments using something called conda environments. So what I mean by that, so for example, you want to do deep learning, right? And you want to install some packages that some of them are not necessarily light. Actually, they're bulky. And you don't use deep learning every day. You know, for example, you want to do machine learning separately. You want to do deep learning. You want to do simple Python calculations. You don't need to have these things installed. So a cool thing with Anaconda is that you can have different environments for different setups. So you can, for example, make create an environment using Conda and say, okay, this environment name is deep learning. And actually we're gonna do that for our course. So we're gonna create an environment, call it deep learning. And then the, every time that, I, that we wanna run our models locally, we're gonna call that environment. And then the, we're gonna work on that in that environment. So this is, this is one cool feature about the Anaconda. And Anaconda offers one of the easiest ways to perform data science and machine learning on your local machine, right? So let's see where we can find the installation link. Basically click on this anaconda.com, go to the products and to this, the distribution, okay? So, okay, so here is the Anaconda website. And as you can see, I'm on a Windows machine. So for you, depending on if you're on a Linux or Mac, you will see different things here. But basically these things are uh, what comes with Anaconda as of today. You know, the, again, the, the, the latest version of Anaconda does support the latest version of scikit-learn as well. So this is really cool news. Okay, so that was the Anaconda part. All right, let's say we have installed Python through Anaconda on our machine and we wanna run it. Okay, so there are different ways that you can run a Python code. So let's talk about them. The first one is if you use JupyterLab, right? So what is JupyterLab? JupyterLab is the latest web-based interactive development environment and for notebooks, codes, and data. So JupyterLab is pretty much easy to work with. You know, you can, so here are some the snapshots. Uh, from a Jupyter lab, how it looks like. So as you can see, you can do, write plain English, plain English text in Markdown language. You can write mathematical formulas. You can add some HTML language in it. And uh, at the same time, you can do coding, right? So there's blocks of, or cells, it's called cells, cells of codes and cells of text that you can put together and come up with a nice documentation. So this is what JupyterLab enables you to do. So you can run your Python code on your local computer in an environment like this. So where the name is coming from, Jupyter, you know, it's, it's a reference to three core programming languages, namely Julia, Python, and R. So this is Jupyter, Jupyter. So where you can find the link for installation, you have to go to jupyter.org and then install. So let's click on it. All right. So, uh, I assume that we have already Python installed. So after that, we simply need to do pip install Jupyter Lab. Okay. 
and uh, yeah another version of well you know that jupyter lab is a notebook so if you want to work with a basic version of this jupyter lab you can work with jupyter notebook which is a lighter version but i personally prefer to work with jupyter lab because it's more flexible and i like the i like the interface better compared to notebook but basically uh, under the hood they are the same you know jupyter lab is coming from a notebook all right so the next one is how we, we run our code on something else okay so let's look into another environment that we can run our python code locally and that is vs code so this is my go-to editor when it comes to coding i love working with vs code it's super powerful it's super flexible and again here's a snapshot you can um, you can do any kind of programming coding you know c python julia r you name it anything and then the good thing is that it's all in one place. So you don't need to install different kind of editors and uh, we can basically use one. Um, so VS Code is one of the most popular sources for code editors. And a source code editor is a text editor program designed specifically for editing uh, source code of computer programs, right? So this is what a source code editor is. Uh, the features include support for, for debugging, syntax, syntax highlighting, intelligent code completion, and code refactoring and embedded Git. So this code completion is really, really power, powerful. But um, the thing is that for VS Code, you have to install some extensions, right? So this is, if you click on this little thing here in your VS Code, you see it comes with some extensions. So the editor itself comes plain and there's nothing installed on it. And then whatever you want to install, you have to install those as extensions. So for example, you want to install uh, Python first. And then after that, you want to install some, um, some code completion uh, packages or extensions that helps you code things. And the latest one that I'm going to do a separate video for that later on is something called code GPT. So code GPT is, is based on the famous language model GPT-3 and while you are coding uh, it can help you to fix your bug so this is this is a really cool extension that I have started working with this with it recently uh, again it's very flexible it's um, all in one place and you can do any kind of coding with that and where you can find the installation link so go to the website code.visualstudio.com let's take a quick look and again, I'm on a, I'm a Windows machine, so for yours, it's, it's, it might be different. But regardless, make sure you read through the documentation to, and you play around with it. I, again, I personally really love working with VS Code. Uh, for this course, however, we're going to stick to our Jupyter Notebook environment. And uh, actually, we're going to run things on a cloud. So let's see what is the cloud-based uh, notebook. Okay, so let's see how we can run things on a cloud. Uh, well, we are going to work with Google Colab, as the name suggests, this is something from Google. And Colab, it's short for collaboratory, is a free hosted Jupyter Notebook style environment. So the cool thing about it, that is, is if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab already, the switching cost is almost zero. So you can switch from Jupyter Notebook to a Google Colab uh, very fast, right? It runs entirely uh, on a cloud and requires no setup. So this is also very useful, right? So for example, if you are on the go, you don't have access to your computer and you just want to run things remotely. So the cool thing about Google Colab is that you can do it. You just need internet connection and a browser. That's it. It provides access to machine learning libraries. So there are some built-in packages with Google Colab that you don't need to install them any, anymore. So for example, uh, if you want to do TensorFlow or Scikit-learn, it's already installed. So you even need to, it, you used to, the, well, it was, it was like this. You, you used to install these packages and then run your code. But now the latest version, you know, as of 2022, um, lots of these machine learning and deep learning packages are already built in and, and installed, so you don't need to install them. It, it gives you some computing resources as well, including GPU and TPUs, but again, depending on which server is closest to you, you may be able to get access to GPU and TPU. Okay. And so Colab allows anybody to write and execute Python code through the browser. Again, as I said, 
all that you need is a browser and internet connection okay and it's as i said earlier it's very 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 well suited for machine learning data analysis and education okay so i i'm going to use google colab for this course but you feel free to run things locally on your local computer using jupyter lab or vs code for all of these things uh, how to work with notebooks how to set up your vs code environments how to use add packages and how to use google colab i have a separate uh, youtube channel so please feel free to check it out if you're not already familiar with them okay so let's go ahead and click on this colab.research.google.com all right so this is the environment so mine is in the dark mode you can so what you're going to see is probably is a light mode uh, is a, it was a white version but basically so it comes it navigates you to this page so this is uh, yeah, a very good documentation put together by Google research team you can go through these things and start by getting started so this is this is where we are and then see what is what is a what is a Google Colab right it, this is this is literally a Jupyter notebook or Jupyter lab right so we have a combination of cells and code and you can run these codes right so again I have talked about these things in very detailed uh, in my uh, dedicated channel for Colab uh, but feel free to uh, skip this part if you're already familiar with Google Colab. All right, so let's go back to the slides. Okay, so the next thing, next we're going to talk about different packages, right? So, so far we installed our Python through Anaconda and we decided to run codes on a cloud, uh, basically Google Colab. Next, let's look into some of the machine learning and deep learning packages that we're going to use for this course. Okay, so the first one is scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is, uh, I think it's safe to say that it's one of the most popular and widely used machine learning packages out there. Uh, it's an open source Python library and includes a variety of supervised, unsupervised uh, learning techniques, right? So you can do classification, regression, and clustering when it comes to, go well, for classification and regression for supervised learning model and clustering and dimensional to reduction, reduction for unsupervised learning model. You can also do some pre-processing and uh, use uh, grid search and cross-validation when it comes to model selection. So as I said, this is a very, very powerful uh, uh, Python library, which is also built in in Google Colab. So if you decide to work with Google Colab for the course, all these packages are already uh, installed. Okay, so the, this package is based on technologies that and libraries that are used in some of the building blocks and most famous packages in Python, namely pandas and NumPy. And for visualization under the hood, it's using Matplotlib. Okay, so here's the link. Uh, let's click on it. I'm going to share these slides with you to, on my GitHub repository, so feel free to download them. So again, this is a, uh, I think reading the documentation of, uh, let me actually see, yeah, reading the documentation of scikit-learn uh, package is is a must thing. You sh you must, uh, if, if you're a machine learning practitioner or if you're interested in this field, you, uh, you must go over the documentation of all of these packages, look at the examples and et cetera. But scikit-learn is one of those packages that I highly, highly encourage you and ask you to do that okay because there's tons of things that you can learn by reading through the documentation okay so again installation if you're doing it on a local computer imagine you have a windows and you have installed uh, python through anaconda you can do something like this you know for example you can say uh, conda install let's see yeah we can uh, so basically here is creating an environment and then install it so by by doing where's this conda install thing yeah, Anaconda list. Oh, sorry. The, the reason that I don't see it here because it seems that in the Anaconda it's already installed. So that's why that's why I don't see the Conda install anymore. Okay, and that was the uh, Socket Learn. Now the next package that I want to talk about is let me pull it up. Is PyCaret? Okay. So PyCaret is also, we're not going to use PyCaret for the deep learning part, but when it comes to the machine learning section that we're going to review it in, in a week or three classes, basically one module, 
I'm going to use PyCaret because it helps us to run multiple machine learning models under the hood and then so compare them and give us a nice table comparing all those models. So it's, it's a, uh, by simply by going over, I don't know, two, three, four lines of code, it's, it makes our job a lot more easier. And so PyCaret is an open source, low code machine learning library. Low code means that literally this is from A to Z, this is oh, maybe 10 lines of code. Uh, it's a Python library and automates your machine learning workflow. So PyCaret is essentially a Python wrapper. So it's a Python wrapper around several machine learning libraries, including uh, Scikit-Learn, SkateTime, this is for time series regression, and some visualization libraries like Yellowbricks when it comes to machine learning, and again, some lots of other uh, packages that PyCaret is a wrapper around those packages. Uh, I have a separate channel, separate playlist for PyCaret on my YouTube channel as well. So feel free to check it out if you're interested. But again, down the road in this course, I will be using PyCaret in one class and show you how we can run codes in PyCaret. At the end of the day, so imagine here's an example for the regression analysis. And we have a train set, test set, we pass it to the model, and then we set up the environment. We say by running this line of code, just compare models, this is the output. The output is going to be something uh, for regression, I think there were A25 or 18, sorry, 18 models under the hood. That's going to show you compare the cross validated R square, RMSE, uh, mean squared error, and etc. And so again, it's, it's very, very, very convenient to start with PyCaret and then see what are the winning models for your specific data set. And then if you want to dig deeper, you can say, pick that model and, and uh, use scikit-learn. So this is mostly for the machine learning part of the course. Uh, okay, so now let's, in, let's get into the deep learning packages for the course, starting with Keras. All right, let's talk about Keras. Well, Keras um, was created back in 2015 by Francois Chalet, who was a researcher at Google, and he released the first version in 2015. Well, actually, we're going to use his textbook for the course. To, I really love his textbooks for deep learning in Python. So he designed Keras to be user-friendly and modular, so users could easily build and experiment with different types of deep learning models, right? So Keras is a modular, high-level, open-source neural network library written in Python. And again, as I said, it was developed to make it easier for researchers and developers to build and experiment with deep learning models, right? So it's a high-level language or package. Uh, the Keras API becomes the official uh, high-level API for TensorFlow 2.0 in 2019. So uh, we know that TensorFlow was around and uh, you were able to apply neural networks you, with TensorFlow. And then they went ahead and uh, bought Keras and they merged it into, well, it, again, Keras became official API for TensorFlow. Okay. So despite this integration, though, Keras is still remaining in a standalone library, and you can use it with that, with other deep learning libraries as well. So you don't need to, you don't have to use it with TensorFlow, but it's easier to use it along with TensorFlow, and this is what we're going to do. Okay, so here's a snapshot of uh, what does Keras look like. Again, these are, so for example, when you're, when you're building machine learning, the deep learning models, uh, we have, for example, a neural network. So the, here's an example. So this is a sequential class. And inside that sequence, we can have different layers, right? We have input layers, we have convolutional layer. And again, this is for computer, um, computer vision that we're going to deal with later on in the course. But as you can see, it's, it's very simple to work with. You can construct uh, neural networks very f easily and fast. I don't know. This is a network with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, the, the, the output layer. Uh, we can do it like this. It's it's modular and uh, it's very straightforward to work with. Okay, so here is the uh, uh, documentation for Keras API. Again, this is also one of those um, packages that I highly, highly encourage you to read through the documentations. There are lots of good examples there. There are, again, there, there are tons of things that you can 
play around with uh, when you're uh, learning deep learning uh, with using cares right so again these are the documentations when it comes to cares and uh, we can talk about different layers, different activation functions, different models, and etc. Okay, so again, the, the list goes on and on, uh, but when the time comes, uh, when I go over the applied part of the class, I will talk about the documentation of Keras a lot. I will refer to this documentation API a lot during the semester. Okay, now let's look into TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is the next uh, popular uh, deep learning package or deep learning you can think of it as a platform so tensorflow is also a google maintained open source end-to-end -end platform for prototyping and assessing machine learning models right primarily it's designed well it's not designed but it's we can we can use neural network with that okay so, uh, so that's that's about the TensorFlow. TensorFlow also offers something called TensorBoard, which helps you to visualize you know whatever you're doing, right? So for here here's a snapshot of the TensorBoard. Oops, oh, sorry. Uh, here's a snapshot. It's a visualization tool for comparing and tracking your learned models, right? So for example, again, we're gonna talk about the, all these things later on in the course, but here I'm looking at um, epoch accuracy. You know, for different so at different epochs, what is the accuracy in the train set and the test set and cross validation version? So these are very cool features that we can we can use. We can actually visualize all these things manually as well, and that's what I'm gonna do. But TensorFlow TensorBoard is also an option that we can definitely utilize. Okay. Uh, a cool thing about TensorFlow is that it can scale from a single CPU to a GPU uh, or cluster of GPUs, all the way up to multi-nodes TPU infrastru infrastructure. So it's very, very scalable. So that, that's why it becomes one of the most popular uh, platforms when it comes to deep learning, okay? And yeah, it is, TensorFlow is already built in in Google Colab, so you don't need to install it if you're using Google Colab because it's coming from the same company and uh, it's going to save you some time because installing tensorflow especially on a uh, macbook uh, especially the the m1 and m2 chips it's not the easiest job and there are some workarounds that you have to google to figure out how to use gpus uh, when it comes to m series chips right but if you're using google colab it's already built in so you don't need to be worried about it okay so for local installation, so I assume that if you don't want to use Google Colab for local installation, here's the documentation for how to how to install it. But again, for this course, we're gonna work with Google Colab, so we don't need to we don't need to be worried about how to install it. But I'm gonna go ahead and click on it anyways. So again, TensorFlow 2.0, and uh, you can again, it's it's not. It's easiest if you install it or on Ubuntu or Windows, but on Mac, uh, it's it's a little, again, as of now, so who knows what uh, changes. It, it was a lot more difficult last year compared to this year, so I assume next year is going to be a lot more easier in installing it on Mac. Okay. All right, so that's the TensorFlow. So now let's go back to the presentation. Now in this slide, let's compare the Keras versus TensorFlow because these are, even though on the surface they're, they're integrated, you know, Keras is integrated in TensorFlow, but deep down they're different. So let's look at the differences. Okay. So both Keras and TensorFlow, uh, they're, they're both fast. And what makes them attractive is that they have so many cool neural network optimization to, features, right? But they are, they're different at some level. So let's talk about the, their differences. So the first one is the level of abstraction. Keras, as I said earlier, is a high level library. It provides more intuitive interface for building and training models, right? While TensorFlow, on the other hand, is a lower level library. So this means that it can, it can be more flexible, but it comes at a cost, you know, right? If, it, if a package is more flexible, it means that it requires you, the user, to specify more details, right? So it is, it is highly used in research and industry uh, if you really know what you're doing deep down. But if you wanna play around with these models at a very high level and you, you don't wanna do lots of customization, Keras might be a better option, right? 
So Keras itself is a standalone library, while TensorFlow includes both low-level and high-level libraries like Keras, right? And it's really too powerful when it comes to numerical computation. And so we use these, both Keras and TensorFlow, for training our machine learning and deep learning models. But in practice, when it comes to machine learning, I personally prefer to use scikit-learn. And for deep learning, I prefer to use Keras alongside with TensorFlow. And so in a nutshell, we can say Keras is a user-friendly interface uh, to TensorFlow, and that makes it easier to build and experiment with deep learning models, right? While TensorFlow is more powerful and flexible library for numerical computation. Again, as I said, it's widely used in research and industry. All right, so that's that. That was pretty much it. You know, we talked about installing Python, how to run it on our local computer, either uh, through a Jupyter notebook or, uh, let's say, VS Code. Then we talked about machine learning packages, namely Scikit-Learn, and then deep learning packages, TensorFlow and Keras. Right. So on my YouTube channel, you can find these playlists. If you don't have a solid background in any of these things, please make sure you watch them before continuing. Uh, this course, right? Because down the road, I assume that you're already familiar with Python, you know some VS Code. Well, for, for, not for this course, we don't need VS Code, but I assume that you, you know how to work with Google Colab and you're already familiar with Py, uh, PyCarrot. Uh, all right. So the next thing, uh, so if I, if I want to put it all together, uh, listed below are some Python packages and platforms that we will use in our deep learning course. So this is setting up our deep learning environment. Uh, when it comes to visualization and some general Python libraries, we will leverage NumPy, Pandas, uh, Matplotlib, and Seaboard. So this is for our manual visualization. For machine learning, uh, we are going to stick to scikit-learn. And when it comes to boosted trees, we will use XGBoost, LightGBM. And for automated machine learning, we're going to do PyCarrot. And finally, for deep learning, we are going to use Keras alongside with TensorFlow. And when it comes to language models and to using transfer learning, we are going to do, or transformers, we're going to use Hugging Face API. Okay, before we wrap up this section, I would like to talk about different ways that you can run your, or set up your Python environment, right? There are pros and cons to each one. Uh, but I think you should know that because for, for our course, it really doesn't matter. We're going to do the Google Colab regardless because the data set that you work with or uh, the scale of the project that you are dealing with, it, it's manageable and uh, we are focusing on the learning side of it. Right? But for you, if you want to scale the project, if you want to work on a bigger problems, probably you should know which route you should go. Right. So I'm going to start with the ones that we're going to do for the course. Basically, it's the Google Colab and talk about advantages and dis disadvantages. Right. So when it comes to advantages of uh, Google Collaboratory, it's, it, it gives you a powerful computing resources, right? Including GPUs and TPUs. We, we talked about it. We said that the Google Colab provides access to GPUs and TPUs for running deep learning models, right? These hardware resources are optimized for machine learning tasks and can significantly improve the performance of your model, right? And uh, more importantly, it has a free tier as well. So there, there, there are some plan-based subscriptions, but the free version, the free tier is really decent and it's, it's good to go for this course. We can stick to the free version. Uh, the second advantage is ease of use, right? Um, the, the Google Colab is very user-friendly. And as we said, it's a Jupyter notebook style kind of environment. So if you're already familiar with those environments, the notebook environments, the switching cost is zero. So that's why it's very straightforward to work with. You can collaborate collaborate using Google Colab, right? So it allows you to share notebooks and collaborate with others in real time. So this is very cool, right? And this makes it a useful platform for teamwork and sharing results and insights, right? Then the next advantage is it doesn't need to set up a, a local environment, right? So everything is already built in, at least all the packages that the, we use for the course is already built in in Google Colab. So you don't need to install anything. You just need to have a browser, internet connection, you're good to go. So you can focus on the theory part of the course. Uh, so these are the advantages. What are the disadvantages, right? So the disadvantage of Google Colab, so the first one is maybe the time limit. So what is that time limit? 
Okay, the first one, as I said, is time limit. Google Colab notebooks have a time limit for running codes, right? If your notebook is left idle for, I think, 90 minutes, it will disconnect and any code that is running will be, will, will be stopped, right? So this can be inconvenient if you are running long training sessions or long experiments. There are ways around it, but I think it's not, uh, in, in the free version, it's not, uh, it's not worth it, right? Uh, so you should uh, may, maybe, again, for the, t for the free version, you have this time limit uh, disadvantage, right? And the next one is hardware limitation. And as you can uh, guess, the Google Cola provides access to GPUs and TPUs, yes. But the thing is that the availability of these hardwares is shared among all users. So this means that the performance of the hardware may vary and you may not always uh, get access to the same level of resources, right? So it, it has this hardware limitation. The next one is data storage. And as you can guess, in the free tier version, the Google Colab provides a limited amount of storage uh, for storing your data and files. So it means that if you're working with the large data sets, you need to store them somewhere else in, in a cloud and then link it to your Google Colab. The next limitation is limited control. Okay, so when using Google Colab, you do not have full control over hardware or software. And uh, this can be limiting if you, for example, want to customize the environment or install additional libraries and tools, right? It's, it's not a straightforward for adding some tools on Google Colab. Then uh, maybe one other disadvantage is internet connection. So this is not a disadvantage. You know, I think, uh, I don't know, for most part of the world, you do have access to the internet connection. But if for whatever reason you don't have access to internet connection, maybe Google Colab is not your best choice. And lastly, the disadvantage is the security, right? So we know that, yeah, while Google Colab is a secure platform, but they're still uh, running some risk, right? There are some risks associated with storing and pre-process and processing your data in a cloud. And this applies to any kind of cloud-based platform. It's not specifically dedicated to Google Colab. So you should, you should be aware of these risks and uh, take appropriate measures to protect your data, right? So that was the Google Colab part. Now let's compare the personal workstation and other cloud-based platforms. Okay, so imagine you want to run things locally on your personal workstation. So what are the advantages? So definitely you have full control over hardware and software. So this is a big advantage. You can do whatever you want. You can install whatever you want and you can... Uh, come up, I don't know, scale or mix and match different hardwares on the go, right? Uh, the other advantage is that you can work offline. So maybe this is one of the biggest advantages, especially if you have security problems. So you don't need to ever connect to the internet to train models on proprietary data or sensitive data. So maybe this is one of the biggest advantages of the running you know, things locally. And one other advantage is it has fixed costs, right? So cost, the term cost seems to me a disadvantage. But what I mean here is that no matter if you run your GPU on your local machine for one hour or hundred hour or thousands of hours, the cost is fixed, right? So you just pay for the electricity and that's it. Uh, but for the cloud platforms, these are, uh, they, they, they are, uh, well, it costs more if you want to run the model uh, in a longer time, right? Okay. The disadvantages of working stations are you no know, scalability. Yes, you can have run models on one GPU or maybe you have two GPUs or maybe three at home. But uh, what if you want to scale it really, really want to scale it to stack up GPUs, right? So that's one dis disadvantage because it's going to be costly. It's going to be super costly. The fixed cost is going to be uh, so high in that sense. And another disadvantage is its maintenance, both hardware and software. Uh, so for, for me, this is a big deal. The maintenance of, I, I used to run things locally on the, with my personal GPU, but at some point I stopped doing that because uh, it's it's hard. It's hard to get, at least it was hard for me to keep up with all the changes that comes to the compatibility of the softwares and things like that. So I decided to just let it go and work with a, a cloud platform. Okay. 
Now, lastly, let's talk about cloud, pl cloud platforms. So, so here I'm showcasing AWS for Amazon, uh, Microsoft Azure, and GCP, Google Cloud Platform. So the advantages are, they, they pro just like Google Colab, it provides uh, powerful computing resources. It's very, very scalable. And again, it's very e easy to work with. It's cost effective. You only pay for whatever you're consuming. So it's called pay as you go. So the, if you run things on a cloud, if the cloud is idle, you don't need to pay anything. And then just like Google Colab, it's the one advantage is collaboration, you know, right? You can work as a team in real time and you can work on the same project. Uh, what are the disadvantages? It is expensive for large scale experiments. So as I was explaining here, you know, uh, uh, if you want to do, I don't know, big, big data uh, training, it's it's going to the cost is going to add up if you want to use more powerful machines and GPUs, stack of GPUs and TPU. So it's going to be uh, expensive. But I think when it comes to training those huge, large models, it's always expensive, right? So, for example, the language models that we have as of today, you know, it, it costs millions of dollars to train them. This, this, our very own chat GPT, the rumors out there is that it costs the company millions in scale of $10 million to train that language model. Okay. Uh, it needs to be confirmed, though, because I just say it as rumors say. Uh, but anyways, th these are expensive, right? And... Uh, the other thing, maybe maybe one of the biggest disadvantage of uh, running things on cloud platforms is this one, dependency on the provider. So this is a big deal, especially for companies. So imagine you're a company, you are working with Microsoft Azure uh, for a long time. The more you work with this cloud, the more the fixed costs you have for switching to another platform, right? So you are dependent on that provider. So it means that you're dependent on their continuous support. You're dependent uh, on, I don't know, the level of service that they provide and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe this is one of the most important Achilles heel when it comes to running things on cl uh, cloud platforms. Oh, this is, there's a typo here. This is not cool. This is cloud. Uh, all right. So again, just like Google Colab, you have limited control and internet connection and security. So the, 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 these three disadvantages are pretty much the same as what we covered in the Google Colab. All right, next, let's talk about the modern machine learning landscape. So here's the part that I'm trying to the, explain the rationale behind the techniques and approaches that I'll be using and utilizing for this course. Uh, so if you look at this chart, you know, from, from 2016 and uh, up to 2020, it seems that the entire machine learning and data science industry has been dominated by these two approaches. One, deep learning. The other one, the, our the great inducing trees, right? So actually, in early 2019, Kaggle, you know, if you're familiar with Kaggle competition, Kaggle ran a survey asking teams that ended up in the top five of the competition since 2017. And they, it, it, it asked them to which primary software or tool they had used in that competition, right? And this is a summary. So these are the number of competitions versus the platform versus the packages and platforms. And as you can see, Keras, deep learning, especially using Keras was the most widely used. And after that, the winners were the LightGBM and XGBoost, basically the gradient boosting trees. And after that, PyTorch and et cetera, right? So that's why I'm focusing, the entire course is developed based on this output, right? So I looked at the winning teams and I saw now using this graph and I realized that, okay, so in this course, if you're developing something useful, it should be utilizing or at least making sure that you're familiar with these techniques. Uh, deep learning using Keras and machine learning using gradient boosting trees, especially light GBM and XGBoost. And this is exactly what I'm gonna cover for this course. And so, as you can see, most practitioners of the deep learning use Keras, and it's usually you use Keras in combination of TensorFlow, and this is exactly what we're gonna do. And uh, for the machine learning, this means that you will need to be familiar with uh, XGBoost, 
and gradient boosting models. So overall, what we're going to take away from, from this slide is that what we need to set up our Python environment or set up our deep learning environment for this course is to be familiar with scikit-learn, XGBoost, and Keras. Okay, so that that's the, and this is exactly what we're going to uh, use. Okay, and then finally, here's another figure that shows and at least support that what we're, our approach in this course is not the worst, right? So it's based on some surveys out there and based on some state of the industry, right? So Kaggle runs this yearly survey among the machine learning uh, practitioners and data scientists. And this survey is one of the most reliable sources for the state of the industry. And the figure shows that the percentage of usage of different machine learning software. So on the um, horizontal axis, we have uh, uh, this, again, the percentage of uh, usage of different uh, packages. So for example, scikit-learn, as I uh, inferred earlier, is the most widely used package when it comes to machine learning. Then we have TensorFlow, Keras, XGBoost. We have PyTorch, where is it? Okay, LightGBM, Carrot, and CatBoost. So as you can see, I cover, in this course, we cover almost all of them except the PyTorch. PyTorch has a separate story. It's, it's, it's heavily used by researchers out there. Uh, the community is growing so fast, but still, if you want to start deep learning as a practitioner, your best option, in my opinion, is TensorFlow because the community is much, much more larger and you can get help a lot faster. But PyTorch is also another fantastic yeah, deep learning package that maybe I'll talk about it later. Okay, so yeah, we cover all of them. So it's going to be super fun. So I'll leave you with that and hopefully you're excited to delve into doing deep learning models using our uh, environment. Okay, so that, that will wrap up our module two, setting up your deep learning environments. Until the next one, take care.